We're here today with Mark Hosiel, uh, Vice President of Firm Services and Global Alliances at the AICPA. And today we're going to go over some survey results from the AICPA's MAP survey. Talks about some key benchmarking topics that your firm might want to take a, a look at and see how you, how you measure up. So welcome, Mark. Thanks, Alex. Good to see you and uh, a pleasure to be here. Thanks. So uh, just give a little overview for those in the audience that might not be aware. Talk about the MAP survey, what it is, how long it's been going on, and then uh, let's jump into some key uh, insights that you gleaned from this year's survey. Great. Yeah, so the, the PCPS TSCPA MAP survey, uh, AICPA took over the management of the survey from the Texas Society of CPAs a number of years ago. Uh, and so it's the largest survey of its kind, the benchmarking survey. We had, in the current year, we had just shy of 1,800 participants. So for us, it's really important to get uh, a good insight from the variety of size firms that are out there. There's other surveys that focus on larger firms or other size firms that are out there, but this really is kind of a good slice across the profession from the sole practitioner all the way up to, to some large firms. So it's done every two years. We used to do it every year, but especially for our smaller firms, I think it became uh, very cumbersome to try and do. It's a lot of information we're asking for in a very short period of time. So we went, went to every two years and the Metrics really don't change that greatly year to year. Uh, we may eventually go back to an annual uh, based on new platform that we created this year, uh, started to use. So, uh, you know, and it's a way for firms then to kind of gauge themselves uh, against the profession as a whole and try and slice it by whether it's region or firm size by revenues, uh, really an opportunity to say, okay, how am I doing in relation to other firms that are out there financially, uh, benefit-wise, uh, technology, the types of technology that I'm, I'm using versus others. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a, a great way to do that. And CPAs love their numbers, so uh, it's amazing how interested our, our members are to see it. So it's uh, it really is a good service. PCPS members uh, who participate in a survey get uh, full results, they get their, their full results back and then they have access to the platform to be able to really slice and dice the data. And the new platform this year is absolutely phenomenal. I've already gotten some really great feedback from members saying this is, this is great and this is really what they've been looking for for a long period of time. Uh, so I, I, we're happy about that. Yeah, and I want to talk uh, about that at the end to show uh, we were going through earlier about some drill downs. You know, mm -hmm. you, you get this large report, but there's it's right. it's kind of like it's a lot to, to delve into with this platform online where you can really say, you know, if you're a firm of two people in Maryland, right. you know, how you compare. So so let's get started. Um, what did you find out this year? Yeah, and so uh, to level set, before I tell those numbers, we have some kind of do's and don'ts that we talk about right. uh, in benchmarking. And, and the reason is, you know, this is, we have, in this year, the, the one change, probably the largest change, would be to go to medians rather than averages. And what that does then is going for a median, that central point, uh, really kind of eliminates the, the outliers skewing the data. And mm -hmm. so there, you know, for the majority of the data that we've received, average and median would have been pretty close to each other. But there's a couple of things that really kind of changed a little bit this year. So, uh, you know, the important thing is to understand the data, be able to relate yourself and, and not necessarily get hung up on the dollar numbers. Right, but to really look at the percentages and and, uh, and and please not trying to manage your firm to be average, right? So that that median benchmark isn't where we should. That shouldn't be our goal, right. right? That should just be that point in time, and we should understand what's better and what's not in certain areas, uh, and be able to try and improve the firm off of that. But again, these are just benchmarks and 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 the median. So that's not. How, it's a good reference, but you can't necessarily always manage your firm against it. So, right. but there are opportunities to to find improvements or in and around you do. Uh, so this year, uh, some of the things that, that, that we looked at and some of the key profit drivers that we talk about, you know, is really in the billing collection, the revenue per FTE, not revenue per employee, but revenue per full-time equivalent, understanding that there are more firms going with part-timers uh, and understanding just how the, to, to structure the dollars as far as the number of people you need to get the work done. Uh, the average partner managed billing. 
right? So the, the revenue per partner uh, and taking a look at that and seeing how that uh, goes. And then we'll talk a little bit about the partner comp relative to the net remaining per owner. Two very different numbers and could be really different depending on the firm. And so there's really been some changes to that for this year. So generally speaking, some of the, some of the insights that we saw uh, this year and now, so this is a 2014 survey, so it's based on the last year-end data for the firm. So many firms, it may be 12, 31, 13. So it's already a little dated, I guess, but it, again, it's not about the dollars, and it's not about the dollars, it's those percentages of improvement and, and what we can do with it. So uh, the growth rate uh, this year was, you know, give or take between four and 8%, depending on the firm size, and we'll show some of that detail. Uh, so we're seeing growth, it's not the growth that we had pre-recession, right. right? But it is growth all the same. And, and that's across the board, all firm sizes. Generally speaking, yeah. I mean, you'll have pockets of markets that may be seeing some decline, uh, but yeah, all firm sizes, the, the median, they, they were all experiencing some level of growth, okay. some more than others. Uh, you know, and there may be some merger activity that's reflected in there. What's interesting though, is when you look at the actual growth rate of the firm and the growth of the revenue perspective, uh, that doesn't necessarily all feed down to the bottom line. Because if you looked at the net income as a percentage of revenues, that really kind of flatlined a little bit. And firms did some improvement, so the dollars looked better, but those percentages uh, were a little different. So listening to the prior session to this, right, and just great discussions about technology and moving to the cloud and all these different types of services, the question is, is it moving to profitability for the firm? Mm -hmm. Are firms taking advantage of that technology to the point where they're able to profit from it, or are they just doing more uh, for more clients for less money. Right. And that profitability thing, I think, is a key component today. And also, we are at kind of that juncture right now where we really need to challenge the business model. So the hourly rate and, and charging by the hour, is that truly capturing profitability for us as a, as a firm, as a profession? And when we look at the different firm sizes and what they're focusing on, we are seeing some firms that are more profitable throwing out those older measures, looking at things that are different. So uh, that's kind of the, the overall landscape that we've seen okay. so far. So with that, if you wanna uh, just talk about who responded, and I'm gonna kind of fly through the first couple of slides. Sure. Uh, I do think that these slides will be made available to participants if they want to see it. So we kind of did an overview of some of the, the, the upfront things. So uh, going into who responded uh, nationally, uh, so there's uh, the first slide showing the kind of pie chart. And again, as I said, on the, on the right-hand side, 1773 versus uh, in 2012, we were a little over 2,000. So we actually had a few hundred less in mm. 2012. Uh, but change is a difficult thing in the accounting profession. And we did change vendors. We changed platforms to what we did. Uh, and so we did lose uh, some firms along the way, but we think we're going to get them back in, in the upcoming years. I mean, it's still a great number. You're still looking at nearly 2,000 people, and you're and the way that you're slicing and dicing it, it it's it, 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 it's it, it. Well, thank you for that uh, <laughs> the vote of confidence, and I feel the same way. It is the largest uh, of its of its kind. Uh, so to you know, it's. It, Worldwide, I mean, we, I've talked to a lot of member bodies in other countries. No one does this type of benchmarking data. And for us, uh, I think it's a really great service to our members. And you kind of see the breakdown between the, the different firm sizes. So mm -hmm. 200,000 is our smallest slice, and then up to uh, firms over 10 million in size. If I break down firm sizes at AICPA, we have 44,000 practice units, right? So. That 10 million plus category, there's only a population of about uh, 400, 450 firms that are even in that category. Right. Right. So we can't slice it that much thinner beyond that. 
uh, in what we have, and, and that's, again, the smallest category of and, what we have. And, you know, for the purpose of, of this webinar, I think a lot of people that are on the, on the webinar today are, are the smaller firms that right. are a few, a few practitioners, and, and they're really looking to figure out how to, again, gain efficiencies. It's, it's not necessarily that they're going out to, to double in size. They're just trying to make the best use of what right. they have. Right, and, that, you know, that's a great point. So the beauty of this survey, especially with the new platform now, right? So let's say that you're in that... 500 to 750 category. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay, my strategy is to get bigger. So what are they doing in the 750 to one and a half million category for me to understand benchmarks? How many FTEs do I need? How many, you know, what type of revenues are they doing? Right. What's their, their, their kind of uh, revenue split between the different things that they're doing? That's the beauty of the survey and being able Spy to- Spy on them. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit, right? Uh, but I think it's, it's important. And the same for five to 10 million, I wanna grow to 10 million plus. So what are just some of the metrics to do it? You know, and if you look at uh, like number of professionals per partner, that number changes significantly as you, as you grow in size. Okay. Uh, and then we have other firms who say, I don't wanna grow at all. I just wanna maintain where I'm at. And so they can stay right within their kind of, their skew and say, okay, this is, this is where I'm at and this is where I wanna keep, keep going, so. All right, so let's get into some of the numbers. All right, so if we look at change in net fees, and I said between four and four and eight percent, generally speaking, in 2014, uh, it's very interesting as you look at this, and uh, you know, for everyone to keep in mind that it's typically the prior year data. So you see the even years that are here are typically based on the odd year performance. So 2008 is when we hit into the recession, uh, and you see the great growth numbers. And pri prior to 2008, 06, 04, 02, they all had virtually double digit growth yeah. in the majority of the size firms that were there. And we haven't gotten back to that. And so in 2010, looking at 2009, you see kind of the flat line of the profession and some did a little better than others. Uh, and it was interesting as I would travel the country around that time and, and you know, I'd talk to firms and I'd say, how's it going? And they're like, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna <laughs> make it, right? And I said, well, well, how bad is it? How bad are you down? Well, we're not down, we're actually up 2%. And I'm like, are you kidding? You know how many of your small business clients would kill just to be flat right now? You know, they're suffering 20 to 30% declines and in the accounting profession, we fared pretty well considering. Um, and, and when you look at the bottom line during that time, you know, firms definitely sharpened their pencil during that time and held on to profitability. Is there anything, any questions in there about why, what the reason is for growth? I mean, I know you mentioned maybe some mergers. I'm assuming most of it was organic, especially with the smaller firms. Right. But is there any questions around, like, what are you doing? To what do you attribute this? Is it cross-selling services? Is it just being more efficient? Right. Yeah, we, we don't in this survey just because there's so many financial statistics in it and so many questions that we can't, it's just too much data mm -hmm. uh, at that point, unfortunately. But what we, what we do is we kind of validate our, our survey and ask people around the, the profession as we do this. So we have an advisory group, which part of it is the PCPS Executive Committee, and that executive committee is made up of all size firms that are well represented on that committee. And so we'll ask them the question of, of, you know, first of all, do you agree with these numbers? Do these seem to be in line based on the different revenue sizes? And what, what would you attribute it to? And, and so, you know, when we look in growth and services and we break it down into the different product lines, right? So you have uh, a and a accounting and auditing, that's been generally flat, tax is up a little bit, especially with some additional services, sales tax as an example, definitely one that uh, the largest of firms are putting, you know, big groups together to, to handle sales tax. Uh, and then if you look at uh, the consulting services, people are starting to get back into that. So that's affecting those numbers a little bit. That, uh, But the issue is really, if I look at my my existing clients, my share of wallet is pretty flat with my existing clients. So the clients still haven't started to spend more necessarily. So this growth has been more so about getting new clients or, or, or trying to expand into additional services beyond it. Uh, so the numbers still are, you know, it's good, it's, it's growth, uh, but not pre-recession growth like we were saying. Got it. Before, uh, let, let's move on to, yeah, we can go, move on to the next number. I know we have a lot, we have a lot to cover here and then we can go back and, and we'll check and see what other questions are coming in. Great. 
Yeah, so the, the next area is the net client fees per owner, right? So this is kind of that managed book, if you want. And everyone wants to talk about what is that managed book of business. And you see for the largest of firms, you know, what they're asking for, what they're requiring. And this year, the 10 million plus firms are looking at about 1.4 million. And again, I think this is a really important number to understand as you want to grow in your profession uh, from, from one size to another, what are the expectations of partners at that level mm -hmm. and how are we going to get to that point so if i'm a five million dollar firm and i say I, we want to get to 10 million how are we going to do that well we need to rely on uh, being able to sustain that based on going from you know this number that we have now of just shy of what you know about 1.1 million up to about 1.4 1.5 should be our goal and understanding that is a very important piece uh, also interesting in these numbers for this year is the fact that uh, those numbers seem to be up quite a bit from, you know, there's kind of this, this we've had this up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, so pre-recession, we were just shy of 1.4 million. And then that number actually went up uh, just as we came out of the recession. And it w wasn't because the, the top number moved, because we saw that revenue was flat actually for firms. Some had a little bit down but it was that bottom number. One of the numbers has to move to be able yeah. to see that, right? So we actually saw a, a decrease in the number of partners in firms and firms made some really tough decisions. They had to make some tough decisions for staff, uh, but they also had to make some really tough decisions at the partner level. And pre-recession, partner promotion was really driven around uh, a retention tool. Right, So we have really good senior managers, they're great technicians, we just have all this work, let's just promote them into partners so we make sure that they stay and we'll keep them as a technician. We're not going to expect them to be the partner of old that was mm -hmm. there. We kind of changed the game a little bit. Recession hits, then, then what? Well now we have to change the game back and guess what, surprise, get out there and sell. Right, ABC always be closing right. because now we're refocused on that growth and we're not sustain. We're not going to be able to sustain based on the year to year growth expectations that we had. Well, and it sets a bad example for the younger people that are looking to be partner. They say Joe in, in the office over there, and and they know. I mean, if it depends on if you have an open uh, compensation system or not, which is another topic we right. can get into. But you know, they they see what he's bringing in versus what he's not bringing in. Mm -hmm. And you said again, you don't want to strive for average. So if you're seeing this is it, the guy's comfortable, you don't want to you don't want that to be the mindset right. throughout the firm. Right. And I think that this is an important number. You know, I, I heard in the session with uh, both John and Tom, right, transparency came up. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a really important number to really start giving people early on. There's a couple of key metrics to manage the firm. Revenue per professional and then the, the, the revenue per owner, the net client fees per owner. I think it's absolutely essential that both of those numbers are shared with our people at a very early age, because if they then understand if they want to become partners someday, this is going to be the revenue expectation around it. Now, some of that book they're going to get through growth and through retirements of some firms, but then they got to start also building, I don't want to say book, I really hate, we need to move away from everyone has their own individual book, but there's definitely a revenue contribution to the to the firm that, that they're going to have. And, and so I think that this is a really important number to share for people to understand how that number looks and, and drives for the firm and even how they relate to how they're doing with others and absolutely. really get the whole firm behind how are we going to grow this number because that's an important number to grow. Absolutely. So if we look at the, the, the next data point is the net remaining per owner. And so, again, this one I really don't want to get caught up in the dollars per se, right? Okay. So you see uh, the dollars that are here and you see that the net remaining per owner for the 10 million plus has been relatively flat as I said before, so we've seen that. The revenue, that remaining per owner is, is up, actually, for the five to 10 million and, and uh, the next couple of tiers down, and then flat behind that. Generally, it's been flat for the profession. Uh, but if I look at the percentage of the net remaining per owner as a percent of net fees, 
you know, you're looking at about 34% at the 10 million plus category, 33% at the 5 to 10 million category, 37, and then it goes 42, 40, 46, and 53 all the way down at the under 200K. So understanding that, that revenue, how much of that revenue should be expected to be put in pocket. Now, there's a lot of different factors that can affect that. Not every firm uh, manages their business equally in how they put together their expenses and things. So that'll have some adjustment. But that old rule of thumb about a third, a third, a third, right, In, and is how they put together the old billing rates. Uh, that third has improved a bit, especially in a lot of the smallest of firms, and is going to be an important piece to looking forward to make sure that that continues to, to be stable or grow from there. So then I look at owner compensation, and you see this, and again, not as much the numbers, but really what's happening in the fact that, uh, uh, you know, with growth and, and this number, and we're going to look at this in relation to the net remaining per owner, because I think that's the greater statistic. This survey, there, there's no way for us to be able to say, okay, we can line up apples to apples based on who completed the survey, right? So region is, will have a big effect mm -hmm. of this. Uh, size, the, the respondents in the survey based on the size of firms will have a, a, a big uh, effect on what happens. And so, you know, I, I go back to the example. So when I was in practice, I practiced in Buffalo, New York, right? And I could even look at the New York State uh, map survey if I wanted to, if I wanted to get that detailed. But in Buffalo, now I'm going to match up the partner comp in Buffalo compared to New York City, no. I mean, they're going to be very different. And so understanding that and, and just having a good relation of how this number is affected by others. So I really want to drive the conversation. You see the numbers here. And, and so in many of the presentations and even in the, the platform itself, you can see the numbers in a few different ways. So that was the right brain version, the, the graph version. And then we okay. have the left brain version of, of the actual detail that's here so that you'll be able to see that. And so when people see the handout later, uh, uh, they'll be able to see the difference in that. But going now to the relationship between owner comp and net remaining per owner, and you see this slide is 2012's version of that where the, uh, the net remaining per owner uh, is the 10 million category was just slightly higher than the actual partner comp. But for many of the other categories, partner comp was actually higher. And people say, well, how can that be? Mm -hmm. You only have so much of the pie that you can split up, right? And so some of it may be timing differences. Others of it are expenses that get lumped into the K-1 if they do that. But the big story really, as we look at this over like a four-year, four- or six-year trend, uh, is the, how the recession and then post-recession affected what this number does, right? So the net remaining per owner, and again, when we hit the recession, our profitability stayed relatively equal to prior years, even though we were flat to maybe a slight decline during that time. And the firms did a great job of sharpening the pencil to be able to have that, but they didn't want to really necessarily pay that out to all the partners, mm -hmm. right? So now we have to, we have to act like squir squirrels and store our nuts for a little while, right? So we kind of are back to that in 14, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But 2012, you know, the 2010 survey, we asked owners to take a haircut during that time. So partner comp was actually down during that time. Okay. So now they're getting some of that back in the 2011, 12 timeframe. Uh, and now in 2014, again, so, you know, the, some of it is slightly timing differences, but uh, we, we have, again, other reasons as to why that happens in 2014 especially. Okay. So when we look at 14 and we see the fact that the partner comp relative to net remaining per owner, this is probably one of the biggest gaps that I've seen between these two numbers looking at it over the last six, eight years. Absolutely. And so... Again, we went out to members and we were out there trying to get our story. What's our story behind the MAP survey? And many of them agreed with this, and there's a, for a few different reasons. And, and so the, the, the good news reasons, uh, part of it is to anticipate bigger retirement payouts over the next couple of years. So this whole succession issue, retiring partners, we need to make sure that we're going to have the cash flow necessary to do that. All right, so that's scenario number one. Uh, scenario number two was around investment in technology, that that technology investment that they're looking at is probably going to be a little more significant in the next year or two, so they really need to make sure that they have that. 
again the 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 nut analogy. Story, yeah, exactly, yes, so, exactly, exactly, okay. and being able to reinvest that back into the firm. Okay. Those are all the the, the feel good stories, if you will, of of the map survey and what happened here. Some of the other issues that we've seen, and, and this is really, if I look at that five to 10 million category and probably my one and a half to five million category, where we see the, the greatest suspect of this, is in, in our procedures as a firm or in our partner agreements and how partner comp is calculated within the firm, uh, for some reason, we, we try and create this socialist society within the partners and no partner can have, you know, be compensated any more than any of the other partners. So we, we kind of try and even keel the, the partner comp. But when we look at the ownership percentage of the firms, right, there, there are many of these firms that are still first generation firms. So the majority of equity is tied up in one or two people. Right. Now those one or two people are saying, yeah, you know what, we'll pay everybody out equally. Our comp will all look the same, but I'm getting my money back. And I'm gonna get it back through, you know, getting my piece of the equity back. So let's, we'll keep it in the firm, but I'm gonna take that cash out at some point, mm -hmm. whether I do that now and as we redistribute shares, or I'm gonna do that later. Uh, so the partner comp isn't necessarily relative to, and it makes peace at the partner meetings. And this is where partner accountability and unity are really becoming bigger issues because the younger partners are going to want to reinvest that in technology. And our firms that are really progressing nicely, they're anticipating for those retirements and they're, uh, they're investing in technology, they're investing in the future of people. And the younger partners are, are willing to do that for the most part, right? but the older partners want their cash, especially if I am two to three years away from retirement and I know that my, my retirement payout is going to be based on my last three years income, what do I wanna do? I wanna push my income as much as possible in that. And that partner unity now becomes an issue. And a lot of it is because we've never really held partners accountable to the things that make the firm sustainable and move forward. And, and again, we're, you're seeing these mergers. The merger activity that's taking place, a lot, some of that has to do with these partner accountability and unity issues that we're currently faced with as a profession. So something that we're keeping a, a big eye on. Are they still, are any firms moving away from that, you know, the last two years? Years, the last three years, are you seeing any, any anything innovative that formulas that people are coming up with? You know, I th well, again, with the proper partner accountability, I think so because it, you're if some the really progressive firms are putting accountabilities for near retiring partners to be about transitioning the book. Right. And working on successful transition is going to affect your compensation today. Not when you handed your timesheet in, but actually when you, you need to transition 10% of your clients this year to a new growing partner. Did you do that and was it successful? And you are gonna be compensated on that versus being you know, everybody's status quo and just, well, we wanna make everybody happy and make sure we have plenty of time to talk about beef or chicken at the holiday party rather than the bigger issues at the partner meetings. Right. And so I think that's, those are the changes necessary. And we do see firms that are doing that. They're still in the early adopter innovator firms for sure. Good stuff, what else do we got? Uh, the next few uh, deal with the expenses in the, in the profession. And you know, there's, there's really not a lot of room here for uh, massive changes, right? Between the different size firms that are out there. So you see here rent and occupancy, okay, great. You know, is that going to change? Is everyone going to be more remote in what they right. do? Quite possibly. You know, so that number may drop a bit. Uh, but when we look at like promotion and marketing, I always uh, have struggled with that number being so low in comparison and, and really needed. I mean, you look here and, and again, this is profession wide, right? So right. you really need to drill these expense numbers down by the firm sizes that you're in to get a better sense of what others are doing. But I've never seen really a marketing budget that, that was the size and stature uh, profession-wide. You know, the firms that are doing it and focused on it uh, that have been real successful, they've invested more in that. Technology is another one. So, so let's start for a second with marketing. In the ones that are successful, like what percentage are they investing? 
in your in 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 marketing dollars yeah. they're they're easily more into that four to six percent range yeah. for those who aren't it's about one to two percent uh that they're doing and you know it's as a profession so again you you grow from one size to another uh, and, and you say, well, what is it that I need? I'm not sure, right? And I know you're active in, in the Association for Accounting Marketing, and I think you know, understanding what other firms have done have, have been very important, right? So uh, seeing that and understanding it, but you know, that first marketing professional that they hire typically is someone to handle proposals. Right, and it isn't necessarily a strategic marketing a business development person. Business person. Development. And you know, I've read some studies around that where they say, you know, the the firms that actually have business developers, their revenue growth percentage is leaps and bounds higher. Right. It, could, it could be a chicken and the egg kind of thing because they're hired to do that. Right. But it's something that people should really consider. And and you know, when the economy goes bad, where do they cut? They cut marketing. Yep. So it's a uh, that's interesting. All yep. right, what else? Uh, technology, same thing. Uh, computer and technology, that number, uh, again, that grew a bit in 2014. Uh, salaries have been, you know, fairly stable. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you know, insurance has been stable. Uh, interesting that, again, the, uh, when, when we look at the professional education, the CPE, and it's probably not the fairest of number, but this is the, really the only see, thing that we see here. And in, in, the, in the current year, it's just under uh, 1%. And that number typically, the education, the, the knowledge that we're going to expect our people to do going forward. And, you know, maybe there's plenty of cheap education out there, but we're just not investing. We actually invo invest more in the phone than we do in our people mm. uh, as far as the education. And, and so, you know, I... My firm, uh, and I remember on average as we tracked hours, uh, you know, I would typically get anywhere from 80 to 100 hours of education a year in what we did. And it wasn't just about the technical education, and some may say I was just a slow learner, who knows. Uh, but it was really important for to have that because that knowledge turned into some type of profit for the firm. And so looking at that education number, I think, then is important as well. Well, but I, I think I, I'm seeing a lot of firms bringing the education in-house. So yep. that's saving money because they don't, they don't want to spend the extra dollars to fly someone out somewhere. And the, there's a lot of time versus sure. if, you know, it, it's still a time investment if you do an eight-hour session in your firm versus right. if you also have to ha spend the time to fly over there, et cetera. Sure, so. sure. So the, the next piece is in the uh, salaries, and you know, I don't think there's any great surprises here, but again, important to see maybe you know, where you're benchmarked against your revenue slice right now, uh, but then also looking at how much do I have to invest in salaries to sustain that type of revenue in, in that next category as I move forward. Uh, you do see more, uh, you know, the, 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 the parapros a little bit more in the, in the smaller firms that are here being able to get that, that work done. But this number is going to continue to grow uh, as we have our turnover issues that are really coming back. We're going to have to invest more in, in the salaries as we go forward. I mean, it's just the way of life. Does this survey drill down into uh, salary by title or years mm -hmm. experience yeah, as well? Yeah, by, by title. not necessarily, Well, the years we, we try and put, because not every firm uses the same titling mechanism, right. right? So in the survey, we'll ask them for, let's say, a senior manager, and then we'll put the years of experience that we're expecting there. Because even the, the for many firms that I would say would, with, with 20 professionals and under, uh, especially 10 and under, they may not use any type of titling. So they mm -hmm. might have a 20-year person sitting in the firm with no title and, and is not a partner of the firm. So it's just partner and you know the bullpen. So how do you really try and judge uh, salaries in, in the general categories if you didn't have those years? So it's kind of a, a dual purpose as we do it to try and level set it for, for the survey. I mean, I think that's going to be a key statistic for people to look at because I, I'm seeing, again, back to the time before the recession where people were losing people, maybe not to the extent that they were then, but especially the younger generation where they're, they're jumping, not necessarily because they're not happy, but because someone right. down the road is offering them more money. Right, right. So. 
So if, uh, the next one is uh, the billing rate by level, and you see 14 versus 12, and again, this might, this could be, you know, geographic changes. So looking at the year-to-year -year comparison doesn't necessarily mean that billing rates haven't gone up or down or what have you. Uh, I've always struggled with this slide. I've always struggled with this statistic, again, because of when you look at truly what the, what the, client is buying, they're not buying these rates. And some firms will try and use the rates to say, oh, our average billing rate for the firm is $150, $200, whatever it is, right? It's not about that, because you come down to that year-end number. And, and I watched the billing rates grow during the recession, yet revenue was flat or down. So you know, how true is the billable hour when it's not going to equate into this revenue? We just created more work for our firm administrator because we had more write-offs in that particular year versus others, right? And so, uh, again, it, and we're seeing challenges to this. And I see, and you see here, there's, there's many uh, categories with some, some NAs and in the smallest of firms because for some of them, they don't even track it. Right, so they're purely a timeless culture. You know, they know what the market rate is for a particular tax return or for A and A write-up services or or what have you. So it's not an interesting statistic to them. They have to try and break it down. At, at, from your experience, what percentage of firms across the nation actually don't have don't don't charge by the hour? <sighs> So there's really two pieces to that question. There is who doesn't charge by the hour and who has eliminated timesheets altogether. And so there are plenty who will say they don't charge by the hour. Yet they sit there and they, they do their little calculation <laughs> in the back of the room and then they say, okay, here's the price, right? And I used to say that even, even back in, in, in my day of, of trying to price services and as a firm, and we progressed over this, where you know we had had our engagement letter and all around this rate and it, it it this really never logically made sense and this is where our young professionals are challenging it today, because our our old engagement letters say used to say to the client okay client we're going to propose to do this, we have no idea what it's going to cost you but our average billing rate is two hundred dollars an hour for the entire firm right. And then we would get really brave. And then we stopped doing that. We said, because the clients demanded a better way of pricing. And so they said, no, I want a number. And so then we'd, we'd get really brave and we say, we still have no idea what it's going to cost, but we think it'll be between fifteen dollars and $20,000. Right? So when we do that, fifteen dollars to $20,000, what number did the client hear? Fifteen. What number did we hear? Twenty. <laughs> Immediate indifference with the firm and the client because we, you know, we've given them that range. They think, just put the number down. It's a, it's a fixed fee. If you value price it, value pricing is really about the conversation with the client. It's not how you did the little calculation and I have one solid number. It's about getting their wants and needs and incorporating that in. So uh, again, it, the billing rate, it's there. I even, uh, the slide, next slide over shows how you can use the platform to figure out, and that shows the example, like the senior manager is an eight to 10 year experienced person. You can see the median, you can see the 25th percentile, 75th percentile. This is a great uh, slide right here to show the power of the platform and what you get. Because this all then matters within this next slide, the realization for the firm, right? And is, are we realizing what we, sh again, for, for many of the smallest of firms, they don't even calculate it. So you see here, we stopped at 750 because the firms below that, statistically, we, we couldn't even put numbers together mm. because they don't care. Here's my revenue, here are my expenses. Most of them are fixed, even my salaries are generally fixed. Here's my profit, right? So managing the business around that, not around this, this realization number, which really kind of affects less. Because all of that then gears into the next piece, our accounts receivable. Right? And if I'm doing value pricing, I price it up front and I can start to bill it up, up front. front. Right. I could totally, totally do away with this aging completely. And you see here that the over 90 has grown a little bit in 2014 and the rest are generally flat and the current's down a little bit. Right? And I, I use the example back again, <laughs> Buffalo, right? So anyone who's seen the national news in the last couple of weeks, Buffalo got hit with a seven foot storm. Uh, and so, you know, I think back to our billing practices, right? And if it was by the hour, and we had construction contractors, outdoor construction contractors. We knew full well what their cash cycle was. 
Yet we'd go out and we would do the work in the, in the winter. We'd start somewhere after January 15th, and we'd finish the work sometime between February and March. We would 100% bill it. Maybe we did a progress bill somewhere along the way during that time, but then the final bill, final final, came out typically in March or April. Construction contractor in Buffalo, New York, that does outdoor work. Now, how much work are they doing between October and April? None. They have zero revenue coming in, in general, at that point in time. Yet, we're going to put a big bill on their desk at that point and say, please pay this right now. And so that client immediately became a 90-day client. Yep. Be and again, we had the expertise to be able to understand it. And that's where the value of pricing, setting the price up front, getting a deposit down, and then being able to uh, uh, bill monthly or charge monthly, uh, even a credit card, right? Uh, um Credit, I was going to ask in terms of best practices because we, we always hear about you know the, the whip and, and and 90 days and that's like once you get past that it's scary and most most firms aren't calling in lawyers to go after their clients and things. Right. Um, what can they be doing? Um, uh, credit card is great. I mean, it's very few firms that I'm seeing doing that. But but what else are, are they doing in order to to reduce that number? Yeah, and so I I just jumped ahead. So we had the we a couple more shots of the platform, so they'll be able to see that okay. and the unbuilt whip that was out there, and going right into the collections. And and so you know my 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 good friend Ron Baker, who's been on this platform and has taught me yes. so much over the over <laughs> the years, and Ed made me braver in in how how I priced. And and you know I remember you know and I've had these conversations with Ron when you know a new engagement, new potential client, and 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 you you got brave. Finally, and you said, uh, you know, the next is so it's no longer the range of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. I go out to the client and I say, okay, these are the things you asked for. It, it will be twenty thousand dollars, and the client looks at me and says, okay, and you're like, oh. I should answer twenty five. Yeah, <laughs> and at that point, I didn't know what the number was, right? Because right. I never asked the question of what the value is to them, right? Value, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, right? So it's really the client that should help me with that number. And if we have some type of a differentiator, or you know, one of the things that we're seeing, especially in the smaller firms, is this uh, the kind of the tiered pricing, right? So they have three, three different levels, and then people will typically kind of skew. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Ierly did this great. If you look up Dan Ierly on YouTube, he did this kind of test of, of pricing and, and human behavior. And with having three prices, the the most the majority of people out there will tend to lean towards the middle price. So you could really do some adjusting and being able to do that. So pricing it right up, having it up front, and then getting some type of retainer, making it monthly, using a credit card to be able to do that, uh, so that you're not the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, having difficult conversations with clients, and and really we talk a lot about evaluating your clients. Learn your ABCs and get rid of your Ds. Right? F clients, by the way, are family and friends so those who we can't get rid of unfortunately so we look at the D's and firing the D's and and really a lot of that has to do and unfortunately you know I gave the example of the construction contractor it wasn't their fault right that they were a late payer I mean it was based on our practices so we allowed them to be that type of a client so getting braver as ourselves and really having those conversations with the client and making sure that the, 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 the billing upfront, having it, and then uh, just getting it back monthly, I think is great. Okay, I think we have about five minutes left, so I, I wanna check to see if there's any, any questions um, coming in for, from the audience here. Um, in the meantime, I think, uh, I know we have, a, we have a lot of information that people will be able to, to access, but um, let's, Let's focus on you know the, the next three or four that, that people should, if they're not measuring, be measuring some, some interesting things that, yep. uh, that you picked up. Uh, turnover. So we asked a question on turnover, and the turnover percentages, you know, they were, I think, a little light compared to what we're really starting to see in the marketplace now. Uh, but the reasons for the turnover I thought was very interesting. And so, you know, we asked that question. And so this, this slide here kind of tells what percentage of firms experience that as their, one of their top three reasons for the turnover. So you see in the larger firms, left for business and industry, uh, clearly number one, followed by a firm change, number two. Probably the most disturbing number for me is that career change. That, 
and, and we've been mm -hmm. hearing this in the marketplace, that they, the, they are so disenchanted, the, the young professionals, that they're leaving accountancy altogether. They say, right. this, is not what I want, this is not what I signed up for, this is not what I want to do. Again, why the business model really needs to be challenged today to make the profession more attractive as we go forward. So some great stats around turnover, and then you can go specifically. Uh, in the platform, looking at employee benefits, again, you know, what are other people offering? I think that's an important thing to understand. Again, you can break it down by firm size to understand that. I think I, the, the, the last thing that I would want to point out is about technology and the technology questions that we had in there, and there's great information around technology. Uh, the first is, you know, who's accepting credit cards? We just talked yeah. about that, 64% of the respondents. 77% uh, uh, maintain, uh, actively maintain a website. Uh, that's like table stakes, right? I mean, that website, you have to have a website yeah. in today's environment, and it better look good uh, because it actually could work against you if it doesn't. Uh, the remote access, okay, 70%, and then publishing a blog, uh, still uh, a minority at 14%. But this one, I, I, I think here, where we're really asking about cloud-based services, right? And so you heard Bill.com, they were here. Avalier is here running around somewhere with, with sales tax, and there's a lot of great, uh, great cloud-based companies, right? And so as we look at it, how many are using it? You know, so remote backup, and you see the, the, the smaller firms for sure, uh, and, and Jim Burke, I'm sure we'll talk about this a great deal. He's so passionate about using cloud, and his stories about New Jersey and when they got hit by, the, uh, by Hurricane Sandy is absolutely why Every firm should be looking at some type of a cloud-based remote backup in what they do. Cloud-based servers, same thing. Uh, surprised, actually, that the smaller firms, we don't see more of that, that they prefer their broom closet over a cloud-based server, some professional who actually can, can manage that server. Cloud-based software, boom, you're seeing that in a major way, especially in those bigger firms, uh, giving them some, some great leverage, and it's a lot cheaper. It's, you know, the, the cost to start up as a firm today is a lot cheaper uh, than where it used to be. So again, looking at this and understanding what other firms are doing, I think, is, is really important. So um, before you go to this, just um, we're doing a lot of cloud-based stuff this whole, this whole day. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are saying, I want the broom closet and all that, like what, what, why is it? Is it security? What's stopping them? Yeah, I think security, the fear of the unknown. I know I can see my server right here mm -hmm. so I can tell if it's on fire or not or you know, that it's in a city that uh, hasn't uh, been completely powered down like Detroit the other day. But... Uh, you know, in that instance, with Detroit as an example, so any Detroit firm that had a remote backup and a remote servers, uh, those servers, if, if their server was based, if the remote server was based in Detroit, bam, it goes to Phoenix or to some other location, so they're still up and running, even though the entire city's shut down. And so they can even offer to their clients, Jim will have, he's got great stories about that during Sandy, to say to their clients, we can get to your data right. because we have it on remote servers. So I think it's really, uh, but the security always comes up because I don't have it, I don't know, should I be worried about it? Okay, so uh, tell them where they could go, where they can get some more information here. So uh, AICPA.org forward slash PCPS, look for the map survey there. Great filtering options just to show that slide of, of what the uh, map survey could do because those are all the filtering options that you can do to, to really break down what you want to see in your own personalized map survey. Again, PCPS members have access to that to be able to do it. So if they want to see the map survey, within the next couple of weeks, our, our commentary will be out. There's a link to the website if they want to see more information. And so if they're not PCPS members, what do they do? They go to AICPA and they sign up to become a PCPS member. They send me an email and say, why should I be a PCPS member? And I'd be happy to answer that question. And what does PCPS stand for? Private Companies Practice Section. It is the home for firms at the AICPA, and it's a very low cost of investment to be able to get all kinds of great information to help better your firm. Excellent. Well, thanks for being here with us today, Mark. Really appreciate it. Great information in there, and, I mean, we just touched the surface, so thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks.